this institution has quite a reputation. Aravind uh, Eye Hospital, um, as many of you know already uh, very well, is very well regarded around the world. But within the IHI, the institute for, that I work in, Aravind is regarded as a role model for not only the rest of the world, but also for us at IHI, uh, which I think most people at Aravind don't really know. Um, many, many years ago, uh, uh, Bolsi Rajthar, the executive director of LIFO, came to visit IHI, ran into Don Berwick, who is the president and CEO of IHI, who ran Medicare and Medicaid, our largest uh, public payer in the US, uh, and was the inspiration for IHI almost 30 years ago now. Um, and he didn't have a planned meeting with, uh, with Bolsi, but they ended up running into each other in the hallway at IHI, and then they spent the rest of the day together. And by the end of that experience, Don, who usually converts other people to his way of thinking, had become converted to Arvind's way of thinking and through Tulsi's work. So uh, Arvind has very much served as a role model for IHI in many ways. And within the Arvind system, I've been here now in India for the last three weeks uh, studying your system because it's, that's what I do. I, I study systems. I, this is what I love doing is understanding how systems behave, why they act a certain way, what's underneath them, why do they... Why do they create the results that they create? Um, and within the Aravind system, this place, uh, Pondicherry, has its own reputation as being the innovator within an already innovative company. And so it's, it was an honor for me to be invited to come here, to be honest, to, to have a look at this. I, I was here just to visit this beautiful place with my family, and they're off doing something fun right now. Uh, but this, for me, is fun, to have the opportunity to see all the things that you're doing here to see the, um, the little bells on the wheelchairs, the way that you guys have changed medical records, every single thing that you think probably is normal operations, I can see the thought that's gone into creating new ways of thinking. And so I'm gonna share with you a handful of things that we've been, I'll share with you a, a few things. One, what is IHI? Uh, some of you will know this institution that I work for. Many of you won't know this place, so I'll tell you a little bit about IHI. I'll then tell you a little bit about our process for innovating. So the part of the organization that I run is the innovation part. Uh, it's responsible for creating IHI's new work and I, our new thinking. Uh, we are not a delivery system. We don't provide clinical care for patients. I do separately at Cornell, but my main life is at IHI where I run essentially an innovation team that creates new delivery system models. How do we, how do we provide better care for patients? Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about how we run that innovation process, and then I'll give you five uh, primary rules that we use when we're thinking about how to redesign care with examples uh, from our work and from others' work, not just our work, but other people's work that we've studied and admired and looked up to, um, that I hope might help you as you think about the innovation work that you might want to do here in Pondicherry and within the Aravind system. So let me just tell you about IHI for a moment. Again, I said I'd start here. So IHI's uh, origin story, again, going back about 30 years, three decades now, um, I don't know, almost a similar timeline to Aravind, came a little bit after Aravind developed, but is a story of innovation. IHI's story itself is a story of innovation. It's rooted in the idea that we can borrow lessons and concepts and models from engineering, from mathematics, from statistical tools, and from manufacturing and industry, and we could apply those methods and techniques for how to change processes, make them more reliable, and make them uh, uh, treat and care for patients more successfully uh, better if we transferred them over to healthcare with some modification. So going back, <clears throat> this idea was discovered in some ways uh, by a guy, by Don Borwick, the guy on the top who founded IHI, and another gentleman, uh, Blan Godfrey. Blan was a textiles uh, professor, actually, at the University of North Carolina. And Blan's primary claim to fame was that he had worked with folks in Toyota and uh, Motorola and 3M and several other industries for many years studying industrial process manufacturing method and technique. These two met, and they launched an idea that became known as the National Demonstration Project on Quality Improvement in Healthcare, in which they applied ideas from industry to healthcare. And the way they did it was they took 20 hospitals, 20 big hospitals in the US, places like the Massachusetts General Hospital, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, where I trained, um, and several others around the country, and they married them, they partnered them with similar number of Fortune 500 um, manufacturing companies, big com not just manufacturing, they're Fortune 500 big companies that had perfected industrial process, places like Xerox, Canon, uh, Corning, 
glassware, uh, Toyota was one of them, of course. So several of these big companies that uh, had, had developed enormous capability in how to make systems and processes work smoothly. The idea was those companies would donate their time to healthcare. So this was going back some years ago now, many years ago, 30 years ago. And they said, we'll just, we'll just coach your teams. Each team, each hospital had to identify a set of uh, priority initiatives and they had to designate a team. And then the coaches would come from the in, from industry to help them uh, learn the techniques of uh, modern quality improvement and then apply them in their local settings. The project ran for a very short period of time, if you think about it, only nine months between September and June 1986 and 1987. And the problems that they identified were problems that are not unique to hospitals. They weren't unique then, then and they're not unique now. Uh, patient er uh, clinical safety errors, uh, waiting times, ED throughput, OR waiting times, OR throughput times, problems that are present anywhere in the system and may even be still present here in your system. <clears throat> At the end of the story, they had striking results. This initial experiment, nine months in the making, they saw dramatic results in this, in this experiment. These 20 institutions, these 20 hospitals, saw massive reductions in procedural time, in length of stay, in ED wait times, and, and defects in patient safety, what was then quantified as surgical site infections. So massive reductions in these things, which were unprecedented at that time. And these 20 hospitals, as they started to talk about their results with their friends who were running hospitals elsewhere, and those 20 hospitals became 45 hospitals in the next go around, and those 45 hospitals became 75 hospitals, and then it became 125, and then we started IHI. IHI was basically born to teach these methods and techniques in a systematic way to healthcare going forward. IHI's strategy is not unlike I, uh, Arvind's strategy. It's this big goal, you know, uh, end needless blindness. It's a goal of a similar sort. Everyone has the best care and health possible. I think part of the reason that Don and Tosi got along so well those years, so many years ago is that the shared mission, you know, they, they shared IHI and Arvind actually have a very complementary mission and vision. The idea that we would end these big systemic problems in healthcare, whether in vision care or in overall healthcare uh, globally. We do this, uh, the, the mission, we try to achieve our mission and vision through the application of disciplined practical improvement methods, uh, practical uh, improvement methods that are derived from the quality sciences, again, derived from sciences that are in some ways 50, 60 years old, largely perfected in industry and manufacturing, the statistical methods derived from those sources. And that's where a lot of the work that we do has stemmed from. Most of what we do now is about patient safety, providing safe and high quality care, about population health. My, my view is that Arvind is gonna quickly get into the health of populations because the rate of systemic diseases in your population is on the rise. I've seen the CAMP data in 20, uh, uh, what is it now? It's, now it's 2020, I keep forgetting that we're now in a new year. But in 2018, your, your rate of detection of systemic illnesses like diabetes and hypertension was 5% system-wide across camps. It's almost double that now, two years later. So it's almost 10%. And that growth in systemic conditions is gonna lead you directly into the need to manage chronic diseases, which will lead to the need to manage health of whole populations. We build the capability to get better. That's a lot of what we're doing here. And we fundamentally try to spark new action and innovation. Um, <clears throat> We have, uh, most people think of IHI or have thought of IHI as a very US-based organization. We are, our only office is in the United States, but we do have a significant global reach. Now we work in over 40 countries. We have projects on maternal and child health in Bihar and in Andhra Pradesh here in India. Uh, we have a significant project in Bangladesh next door on uh, trying to end uh, early, or trying to improve, I should say, early childhood survival. So significant efforts in the region even, um, in, anyways. <clears throat> so what is it that we're trying to do? So there's this problem that we have in the clinical sciences between in the growth of clinical knowledge, um, and this is true in ophthalmology as it is in all clinical sciences. Uh, every day we publish more and more on what we're supposed to be doing. And our systems, the delivery systems, including this one, that are intended to try to deliver that evidence struggle to keep pace. And so there's this gap between what we know and what we do and IHI is trying to push those curves together. It's not slowing the po pace, importantly, it's not trying to slow the pace of discovery, it's trying to improve the pace of execution, it's trying to improve our pace as a system to be able to deliver the things that matter to our patients most and to 
through the science that we've come to understand the most. The right side of the slide here is how IHI works. Innovation at the heart, as I think in some ways it is here in Pondi. The, no the knowledge that we gain, we try to demonstrate its value or results with a small group of partners. Then once it has demonstrated some capacity, we build capability in others, and then we put everything that we can find onto our website for free, as much as, as we can for free, so that others around the world can get access to these things. So over, over the years, and this is now the transition to, to what we've learned about innovation. What we've learned is that change of any kind uh, is, is challenging, and it involves this two-part problem. The problem of discovery, what should we do, and the problem of execution, as I described it a minute ago. How should we go about doing it? The what we should do is becoming more and more clear. And I, I was remarking earlier about how cataract surgical method in some ways started here in India, but it has evolved so much since the early days into what we know today, this very professional, high quality, highly reliable process and system. The science of cataract surgery is incredible. Same with diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, you can name the cases. And the same is true, I'm a general internist, the same is true for all the conditions that I happen to see around coronary heart disease, acute MIs, et cetera, et cetera. We've learned a, a ton about these conditions over the last century. Um, and that has that pace of discovery has, has quickened. Um, this is a paper from 2010. I don't, I don't have an update on this paper. I wish I did. It's now 10 years old. But in 2010, every single day in the, in the healthcare literature, we are publishing 75 level one studies. That's randomized control studies which are basically telling us what we should be doing in clinical practice every single day. 75 new pieces of information about how we should practice with 11 additional systemic reviews, systematic reviews, to meta-analyses and so forth that put all that data together that also tell us what we should be doing. And the subtitle of this paper was How Will We Ever Keep Up? Right? This is, the, this is the, the in, illustrated in great detail that the pace of discovery is outpacing our ability to keep up, or outpacing our ability to execute. And that, I think, is true in eye care. So this, again, is a map of the world of how often we do the thing that we know we're supposed to be doing, providing the technical uh, service around cataracts uh, uh, to everyone that could possibly need it. And this discrepancy uh, between those that can do and those that are not doing is not due to the lack of burden in these countries. I could have put a map on here. In fact, there was another uh, slide didn't include that showed that the, the distribution of the case rate is not all that different. But what we have is this enormous variation in delivery of this important and effective service that's largely due to our systems being unable to keep up. And that's exactly the problem that IHI spends most of its time thinking about and working on. So our innovation process is designed to help solve this problem. And when we began our innovation process uh, some years ago now, we started with this important understanding. Innovation, I think in the in the popular imagination, maybe less true here because you're a bit more sophisticated about how you think about innovation. In the popular imagination, there's this Einstein myth, right? Einstein suddenly discovered relativity when you know lightning bolts came out of the sky and struck him in the head and he figured it out. You know, Edison built the light bulb overnight. That's not how it works, right? Edison, at least he says, failed a thousand times before he actually developed the light bulb. Innovation is not some event. Innovation is also not exclusively a product that we carry around in our pocket or that will someday drive all of our vehicles. Uh, we regard innovation as a process, and I was asking the team here that is responsible for innovation about the process that we use. This is one representation of innovation as a process. We call this idealized design. It starts with how ideas are generated, the process for taking an idea through a planning, concept design, prototype testing, pilot testing cycle, and then when something proves utility, to adapt that product or service into a, an actual service design. Again, not entirely different. Some of these words are in fact written on your innovation laboratory wall, but having a disciplined process to go from a series of concepts or ideas to actually things that people use is vitally important. It doesn't really much matter. The literature is riddled with ideas about what process is more successful than in the other process. I'll show you ours, but the point is there are many different ways of drawing this process and it doesn't really matter. There's no there's no available evidence that suggests that X way of innovating is better than Y, no matter how many we'll like to tell you that there is. But, but having a process matters enormously. 
there is a uh, in the innovation literature there is a central there's a basic taxonomy of uh, uh, new developments in healthcare. I'm, I'm specifically focused on healthcare innovation here, not on the overall landscape on, uh, you know, on computer science innovation or otherwise. But in in the healthcare innovation space, there's essentially three primary divisions. There are technological innovations. These are new devices, new uh, drugs, new diagnostics, new therapeutics. You, you work on a lot of these things, actually. Oral Lab works on them. You work on them here even in your innovation center. There's business model innovation. Arvind, you know, in 1993, Harvard Business School recognized in its first case that Arvind was onto something with its business model. Um, and in large measure, the recognition that Arvind has gotten has been because of its business model and the innovation you brought to the business concept around how to do this work in this country. There's also in the US other concepts around incentives, around waivers, around new payment models. We're doing, in the US right now, the middle category is probably where the bulk of the energy it lies uh, at this present time in terms of innovating in healthcare. And on the right side is this notion of delivery system innovation, new processes, new roles for people in the system, new models of care. And again, Aravind has done incredible work in this area. Just one example of that is the MLOP system. That's new roles. You've taken uh, folks that uh, have relatively limited training, built significant capacity, lowered the cost basis, the labor cost of the service that you derive and provide, and yet provide it with incredibly high quality uh, to patients that need it. The MLOP system is an example of a delivery innovation. <clears throat> this is not a value system. I have to put this on a slide as a disclaimer because whenever I do presentations like this, the technology innovators in the room get pissed off at me and angry that I sort of suggested that there's some problem with technology innovation. It's not a value system. All three of these are needed. You need technology innovation. You need to be successful. You need technology innovation, you need business model innovation, and you need delivery system innovation. And I'd argue that Arvind actually does all three of these incredibly well and has done so for many, many years uh, over its history. Just to explain uh, where we focus at IHI, most of our work is not in technology. It's increasingly in business model, but it's mostly in delivery model. And the reason that's the case is because of this curve. Uh, since the early 1900s, the pace of discovery, again, in healthcare has been exceptional. But there's been a challenge. In the early days, when we first discovered antibiotics, we suddenly managed, were able to cure diseases that we'd never encountered before. Tuberculosis, which killed millions and millions of people, still does kill millions of people, but it killed, invariably killed millions of people if you got TB. Now it does so at a much lower rate. The discovery of antibiotics, vaccines, uh, surgical techniques, sterile, uh, you know, sterile surgical techniques, these things in the beginning created a significant improvement in outcome at a relatively low cost. As time has gone on, we now innovate and create new things, but the cost of the, the, delivering those technologies, I'll just give you one example, hepatitis C treatment today, we have curative therapy. In the US, it costs $80,000 a patient. Significant cost, and although the outcome is still much better. So this we describe as technology innovation. As we discover new techniques, models, uh, uh, technique, therapeutics, diagnostics, whatever, the pace of that growth is significant. We're discovering more of it, it's leading to better outcomes, but there's a certain leveling off that we've experienced over the last several years where the cost growth exceeds the outcome improvement, in essence. Business model, if you imagine this is a time point today, business model innovation seeks to pull the curve to the left, but relatively horizontally. It's not seeking to get better outcome, it's seeking to lower the cost of providing that care. While delivery innovation, essentially tries to pull the curve to the upper left corner, provide much better care at much lower cost. That's the concept behind delivery model innovation. And so the bulk of our emphasis today is in these two categories, delivery model innovation and business model innovation, uh, with a heavier emphasis on delivery uh, over business model. We had a process back in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Our process for innovating was integrated into Prodigy 2. We have we have at any given point in time at IHI around somewhere between 200 and 300 projects in those 42 countries that I mentioned earlier. And our process for innovation at the time was embedded in those teams. And in fact, it really wasn't a great process. Sometimes great ideas came from that work. A lot of times we didn't move those ideas forward. I heard a bit of that when we spoke earlier today with the innovation team, that sometimes we have good ideas, but we don't have a system or they don't necessarily go all the way to where they get. They need to go. We had a good process, but we, did, we felt it wasn't good enough. 
What we felt was missing was the following few ingredients. We didn't have staff that had some dedicated time or energy to actually create new things. They were, they were left to their own devices when it came to finding the time to do the things that they might want to do. We didn't have a forum for collectively trying to address those challenges that people were surfacing in their day-to-day -day work, uh, something I think that you guys are trying to solve with your innovation lab. We didn't have an organization-wide understanding of innovation. We didn't have predictable timelines upon which an innovation production system would work. We didn't have a laboratory. So a lot of things were missing from our effort. And so, as IHI would do, we went and studied different industry partners, tried to figure out who was doing this well. And we found uh, in a visit to Cincinnati where one, one of our strategic partners is Cincinnati Children's Hospital, uh, a very, uh, one of the biggest, second, you know, I think the second biggest uh, clinical provider for children in the U.S. And they're one of our IHI strategic partners. We've had a relationship with them for over two decades. And on a visit to Cincinnati, they said, when we were talking about this problem of how we innovate, they said, you have to visit Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble is responsible for making, uh, you know, uh, th th hundreds of consumer goods in, in the U.S. Tide, you know, laundry detergent, uh, toothpaste, you, diapers, you name it, they probably make it. And I'm guessing that many products they make here in India as well under different names. But P&G has had, at that time, an incredibly robust innovation system, very customer-centric, very driven from within. And we went and studied their system, and we were in awe. They, they had an incredible process. Their, their approach was to identify a specific challenging question. They had an enormous network of innovators distributed throughout the world in every global office of P&G, a group of people that were responsible for innovation or had some connection to innovation that they were sourcing ideas from constantly throughout their system. And then they had a disciplined process, a timeline. In this case, it was 90 days. And at the end of the 90-day period, as they walked the project through this process, they would generate a new prototype or a product that, or something that they would generate as a set of recommendations at the end of each cycle. So we studied this process. We visited them several times. And we ended up building our own version of the 90-day process. And this is now our innovation process. We, we focus on finding a question. This is probably the hardest step. I understand that that might be part of the challenge here too. Finding a good question, posing that question well, refining it so that you can actually make it answerable within a, the 90 day period is the most challenging part of the process. We then scan the literature, conduct uh, various interviews with stakeholders and people that might have some idea about how to make the system better, build a theory of how to make the thing better, design a prototype, which is something that you do as well, that's the focus of the design step, and then within the 90 day period, it took a lot of pressure on us to do this very quickly, we test that prototype with someone in the system that originally had the question. So this is the process that we have, and we iteratively conduct these 90 day cycles until we reach a product or a solution that solves the original challenge or problem that we had. <clears throat> We've described all this in a paper that we published now about our, about our process. And there's two different, what we found is that there's often this, not only, there's, there's phenotypes of these 90-day cycles, one of which is a learning cycle, and another which focuses on the testing process. And essentially, it starts at the bottom, where we conduct, we have an initial observation. That usually comes in the form of a clinician or an administrator identifying a problem in a system, or a variance, a positive variance that is, is symbolic of something that might be a solution to a felt problem or need. So there's an observation of a dynamic raw event. There's then some organization of that event and any other subsequent observations. And then we develop an initial theory of action. How might we change or solve this problem? And then go about trying to validate that theory through testing, initially developing a prototype and testing it, and then piloting it on a larger and larger scale. This essential flow is how we build solutions to common problems, some of which I'll show you. Here's a sample of a, of a set of questions. Every 90 days, we take somewhere between five and seven questions. Here, there's seven questions that we're working on. This is a recent wave. Working on with dentists on oral health care for seniors, and working on developing, uh, we were essentially trying to engineer movements in healthcare. That's what community purpose was about. Um, working on something called quality planning. I, I don't want to get into the details of each of these, but essentially, these were the types of questions. Working on uh, patient safety, integrating health equity into patient safety, working with rural hospitals, especially on maternal and child health, which is a problem we have in Africa and Asia, how to actually reach very rural settings, trying to develop uh, uh, better labor and delivery technology and capability in those settings, 
and so on and so on throughout this. And again, these slides will be available to you, so if you have any questions or want to see what questions we're specifically asking, these are the kinds of questions that we're asking. The most important is that we start with a, often we start with a how might we get to X, Y, or Z kind of question. The how might we concept is often frames a, a good innovation question that allows discovery and building new knowledge within a particular area. Here's one example of a project that we did. Uh, we worked with Bob Kaplan, who is uh, from the Harvard Business School. Um, Bob, many, many years ago, decades ago, invented a methodology to track costs of care, um, actually focused on operating rooms originally. So he tracked every single detail of what happened in the operating room and put a cost to it, and then created what he called time-driven activity-based costing. That means if a nurse spent three minutes in the setting, the cost of those three minutes was understood and, 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 and could be calculated. That, using that kind of logic, including this consumable costs and so on, you could actually calculate the value, the total cost of the operating room in that procedure. The problem with that, with that is that as soon as you make a change to that surgical procedure or process, all of that information that meticulously was captured through the time-driven activity-based costing method basically became obsolete. And our methodology was rapidly trying to change systems, right? Constantly trying to change systems. So we were making all of this robustly captured cost information obsolete almost on day one of a project. And so we needed a new method for understanding how to capture costs on, in a real-time basis from frontline clinical service teams. I won't go into the details of how we actually ended up doing that, but we basically married frontline cost information with a process improvement method and a management technique and drove down costs very significantly over a series of, period, of, of times. This is one unit in a, a hospital in the National Health Service in Scotland. This is a respiratory unit. And just the first, this was the Sentinel unit, the first unit that we did this in. Using that methodology that we had derived for how to do real-time costing, we drove costs down by 25% because we gave frontline nursing teams knowledge not only about patient safety issues, but also about cost. And they systematically worked on these things. Here's another one. This is a, a, a cardiac hospital in, in Doha in Qatar. They took the same methodology and used it not only to drive down costs, but also to increase time at the bedside for nurses from 56% to 75%. This is a, <coughs> essentially, now nurses are being uh, more used at the top of their license to provide only the care that they can provide rather than doing clinical work. IHI measures us very meticulously. I don't know how innovation is measured here or within the Harvard system, but it's our duty to essentially make it worth IHI's while. We're an investment, we're a cost center in order. And so we have to generate evidence that the things that we create produce value for the system. And so our rough rule of thumb is that we have to produce 10 times the value that is invested in us. So roughly speaking, uh, we have to generate about 10 to $15 million in revenue annually uh, on that effort. And we quantify very meticulously all the things that emerge from all the work that we do in our innovations, uh, innovation activity. These are all projects or new methods that we've used in projects that are showing. So we have this, um, and so now I want to just show you a couple of these five rules that I mentioned. So our first law, when we're trying to improve a system, we use this, uh, this is our, given to us by Paul Batalden, who is one of IHI's founders, in addition to Don and Glenn that I showed you earlier. But Paul said that every system is perfectly designed to give you the results that it's getting. So the results that you're getting here is due to the way that the system is designed. If you want a different result in your system, you have to change, if you want a different result, you have to change the system in some fundamental way. So uh, Edward de Bono uh, says that if you want to create a new system, you have to use what he described uh, as lateral thinking. That is, the normal trajectory of thought you know, operates in one axis, but you have to often use a provocation of some kind to lift you out of that normal trajectory of thought and move you into a different frame of reference so that you might think differently going forward. So these five ideas that I'm going to share with you now, I'm, hope, I'm hoping will actually provoke you to go from a normal axis of thought that you may have into some of these lateral thinking that might cause you to have some other ideas about what to do next. They come from a group of organizations mainly based in the U.S. These are 47 healthcare organizations based in the U.S. that are trying to build innovative new models for how to take care of patients with chronic disease. So the, the, the basis of these five uh, redesign rules are from systems primarily in the US. There's a handful from Sweden and Canada and other parts of the world uh, that participate in this exercise, but most of them are from the, from the US right now. 
These are those five rules, and I'll go through examples of each of these in a moment. The first one is move knowledge, not people. Number two, question the premise, the accepted premise that you're given. Three, find positive deviance. Four, assume ab abundance. And five, change the balance of power. And by that one, I mean change the balance of power between patients and doctors. So the first one is about um, moving knowledge, not people. And we were talking earlier about artificial intelligence, and I know Arvind is starting to think a lot about AI. AI gets a lot of attention these days. I think it's, it's seen as potentially a future hope for healthcare, uh, but it's not so far into the future. And here's one example of how I think AI, how we're starting to learn how AI can bring, can close some of that gap between what we know and what we should be doing. So here's just one company that we've been working with actively. This is Buoy Health. I don't, I, ignore the, I'm not advertising for Buoy, by the way, so this is not about them, but it's about the concept here that I think is really important. They took 500 urgent care patients, and what they did was they compared their diagnostic and triage accuracy for some common conditions like chest pain and headache and so on, and they compared a clinician making the diagnosis and triaging the patient versus the AI symptom tracker. And the symptom tracker basically works, you know, your patient puts in through actually a chat mechanism, they put in all their symptoms, and then the AI algorithm figures out whether they have X, Y, whether they have a serious chest pain issue, need to be referred, or whether they have, you know, atypical angina or they have nothing at all uh, and this is not something that needs further work on. <clears throat> the accuracy was phenomenal. 90% of the time the AI tool got it right and 92% of the time the patient was triage accurately. So what's happening with this technology? It's now being integrated in certain instances in primary care. I think this is the, a sign of things to come. So we were working with uh, a major primary care company in the U.S. to try to build some of this AI-based technique into the management of uh, routine primary care conditions. So again, the patient puts in their conditions, um, a bot, essentially an AI bot on the other end of the line, is you know, screening those things based on demographics, you know, age, gender, um, other basic information that the patient enters, uh, comparing these symptoms against what people who have previously entered data into that, into those, have, have reported before. There's often uh, an ability to capture images also so the patient can take pictures of rashes or other conditions that they might have. And then a diagnosis, a presumptive diagnosis is made uh, and sent to a clinic, to the clinic that we're working with. And the clinic then verifies that this diagnosis seems plausible. If there's anything that the clinician uh, disagrees with, they obviously call the patient and they deal with it. Uh, the reason this matters is as I was saying downstairs when we were doing our tour of the hospital, the process of gathering information in a clinical visit, on average, is about half the visit. And if your AI tool can automate that before the visit even takes place, and gather 50, you can cut the visit time in half, which for a busy primary care practice is a significant potential opportunity, economic opportunity. The diagnosis time, five to 10%, similar with the treatment time. And then secondly, the care plan, which is the, which is the next part of the uh, next big chunk, 18% of the time is often, 18 to 20% of the time is often spent there. And then charting, where another bulk of the time, where doc, doctors now spend a lot of time in front of computers like this one, typing things that, in the US. And in fact, it's seen as a big source of burnout and uh, you know, dissatisfaction among healthcare providers. And so what these AI tools are now able to do is they pre-populate basically your, your note, and that makes it easier for the clinician, if they agree with the diagnosis, to quickly verify the diagnosis amend the treatment plan as needed, and send the patient on their way. The notion here is not to replace primary care doctors. The idea here is to increase the panel size of primary care doctors. So the average primary care doctor right now in the US is about a one to 2,000 to 2,500, depending on the nature, nature of the practice, 2,000 to 2,500 patients. With this technology now, which is commercially available and we're using it in these settings, we're now able to increase the panel size to about 5,000, maybe 6,000 patients per doctor. Um, so just an incredible opportunity, I think, in the way that we're seeing. And the reason I say call this moving knowledge, not people, is that what AI tools are allowing us to do is the patient rarely even has to come into the office any longer. They just, they get their diagnosis, the doctor verifies it, then calls the patient, calls the prescription in. The whole visit process is avoided, and the patient doesn't move. The knowledge that's necessary to care for the patient has moved. Um, Move knowledge, not people. The second one is question the premise. Here, uh, this goes back, uh, the concept here is that we often accept in, in 
healthcare and in physician practice some truths that are not truths. We accept the notion that certain li there are certain limitations in how we might care for people or otherwise that may not be actually true. That might be not be true limitations. So here's an example of this playing out. I'll just tell you what happened. Hepatitis C in New Mexico, back in early 2000s, <clears throat> the estimated number was 28,000 patients. Only a handful of those patients were actually being treated, and that was largely because of the fact that uh, that was largely because of the fact that there was a preconception, a premise, that the only place you could get good quality clinical care for hepatitis C was in the large academic urban treatment center in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where there was a specialist Hep C doctor who was sitting there who could take care of those patients. So you can imagine that his patient panel was whatever it was a specialist, he had a very limited patient panel, less than 2,000 patients. And so he could take care of a very small, fra small fraction of the total volume in the state of uh, New Mexico. So his name was Sanjeev Arora, and he started something called Project ECHO. And ECHO was known with basically a telemedicine concept. There's, uh, there's him in the middle. That's Sanjeev Arora in the middle with the tie on. Around him is a team of clinicians, social workers, nurses, doctors, uh, some, some, some subspecialists that were relevant to hep C treatment at the time, including himself. He's at the mothership. He's at Albuquerque, New Mexico. And around him are primary care clinics, not hepatitis. These are not GI docs. These are primary care doctors, and these would be satellite centers, that this team at the center, central office is training to do high-quality hepatitis C care in the periphery in the rural most clinics in New Mexico where patients desperately needed this attention. Sanjeev was questioning the premise. The accepted mythology was that only he could treat hepatitis C. His notion was that that was not, uh, that was not a truth. He was questioning the premise and saying, any primary care doctor with accurate or adequate treatment could in fact take just as good care of hepatitis C. So they, in order to validate that premise, he set up a study, randomized study, where he randomized patients to come to see him versus be seen at one of these echo locations, as it was called, um, in the primary care centers in, in their area. They published the data in the New England Journal in 2011. Here's the finding. Echo, the echo column okay, is the satellite primary care sites. The UNMH column is the large academic urban center in Albuquerque where Sanjeev was made. They're non-significantly different for both the virological outcomes. SVR is the sustained virologic response of genotype one and genotype two and three. These are the definition of cure at the time. Things have changed in the hep C world. There's now other medications that treat these things. But at the time, this is what was deemed to be the most important outcome of treatment. And you can see that between the primary care treated patients and the patients treated by the subspecialist, there was no difference, non-significant differences in outcome. In spite of the fact that generally the primary care patients were more minority patients, they were more rural, and they were generally poorer um, than the patients that were treated in the high in the academic center. Okay, So they got the same uh, results despite that. They questioned the premise and got better results. The third way that we are starting to think of how to innovate and think differently is the idea of finding positive deviants. I don't know how... Uh, much this language will resonate here, but the notion of a positive deviant is in any problem, in any situation, in any system, you'll have a normal distribution. In, in, presume, in, in most cases, without intervention, you'll have a normally distributed uh, set of responses. That means that in any system, there'll be some that succeed in the system despite the odds. Find those people. Find those systems, find those actors, find those solutions, because whatever they're doing might have clues for what the solution needs to be for the rest. So I'll just tell you a story from Vietnam with Jerry Stern, um, who in the early 1990s worked for Save the Children. And the idea of, of positive deviant analysis really comes from, from this guy. Um, what he did in the early 1990s, well, he was, he was sent, to, uh, sent to Vietnam by Save the Children with the primary purpose of ending malnutrition. That was his ambition. He went to the Ministry of, of Health and started asking questions about what were the causes. And he went to the Ministry of Family Welfare, the Ministry of uh, all the all the relevant people that you would think, all the experts in the academic universities. And they say this goal of trying to end childhood malnutrition is impossible. Here are some ideas. 
And what he, what he came up with, he called it the true but the TBU, the true but useless information that he was given by various ministerial officials and otherwise. And so he decided with his wife to go to the fields, to go to the rural most parts of Vietnam and find uh, and try to understand the problem and document the problem more, more intimately. And what he found in any village was that there was a handful of children that were in fact not malnourished, right? As you would expect, there's a normal distribution of childhood illness and there were always children that were not malnourished in the villages. Those were the positive deviants. He studied those families. He said, what was it that these families were doing with the way that they were feeding their children that might have pulled clues for how to build a program, a public health program or public health intervention that would improve childhood malnutrition? He studied those children. He found that those families, compared to the other families that had malnourished children, uh, did things that were systematically different. They had smaller meals. They had to they were hand fed. They were fed four or five meals a day. They all used a certain type of water that had uh, briny shrimp in it, this tiny little shrimp that added a protein source. They were using these green vegetable um, leaves uh, that were considered these potato leaves that were considered low class food, but the families of the non malnourished children were using those leaves in their food preparation. And so Jerry said, these are the distilled that down into a small set of interventions, four or five, the ones that I just mentioned. And then he took that show on the road. He actually asked the mothers to teach other mothers to do these five things. And slowly but surely in the villages that Jerry worked in, now malnourished now children, the number of malnourished children, children started to drop. When we face an apparently unsolvable problem in healthcare, I, our innovation team tends to ask, where is it being solved today? So I think this notion of positive deviant analysis where you can, where he can be found, if there is an opportunity to find someone who's got even the, the smallest clue about where there's an opportunity to go, uh, I would argue that that's the place to go. Back in 2003 and 2004, I worked at the World Health Organization on HIV, and my primary job at the time, actually my primary job at the time was to figure out procurement rules in sub-Saharan Africa to try to get antiretroviral drugs at the, at, into Uganda, Tanzania, and a variety of other places. We won't get into that. But what we were primarily doing was studying the countries that had larger, these were, almost everyone had a very, very small interretroviral treatment program, but there were certain countries that had succeeded. Thailand was the number one example of a country that actually had far, far more patients on interretroviral therapy than any other. And so we went to Thailand to study specifically what they were doing with their procurement, with their clinical protocols, with their approach to systemic uh, illness, et cetera. And Thailand was doing things that were fundamentally different than what many of us were finding in some of the other countries that we did. So we tried to replicate those things in the, in, in the effort. And during that period, we saw a almost tenfold increase of patients when we were replicating these things in Sub-Saharan Africa. We saw almost a tenfold increase in patients being placed on retroviral uh, therapy uh, in, over that duration between 2003 and 2005. The fourth rule is assume abundance. Um, and this one is about using all the resources in an environment that can help you to get the outcomes that you see, including all the assets of individuals and family members, and including uh, resources that go well beyond the walls of healthcare into homes and families and other industries. And here's an example from a project we worked on in Chile uh, with an organization called Oportunidad. This, uh, this effort was an obesity prevention program, and we were working on it, they'd been working on it for years in healthcare, trying to help coach uh, parents to eliminate sugar sweetened beverages and you know uh, reduce uh, change their sort of dietary patterns and their habits, increase exercise, you know all the things that you would imagine they've been trying to do, and then somebody had the idea of not just working on the home environment, but actually working in the schools. And what they found was that when they started to work in the schools, again assuming abundance, was that they had a set of active, very active and interested. Uh, teachers who learned methods of quality improvement, plan to study act cycles, and then they set for themselves these goals as a classroom to eliminate sugar sweetened beverages and increase water uptake in their classrooms. And this is what they did. They used the plan to study act cycle methodology, which is just a way of testing and learning from changes. They made pitchers of water available. They asked parents to stop sending juices with their lunches. They developed a simple child-centered measurement this is the child-centered measurement tool that they used. The children put their pictures in these little shapes, and every time they drank a cup of water, they placed, you can see some of them have these little beads on them. Each bead represents a glass of water that the children drank. 
and they would try to get to the top of the thing by the end of the week. Right? This is the child-centered way of measuring how much water consumption they're having. And they didn't get any, they didn't get any uh, little beads if they drank soda or they drank sugar-sweetened beverages. Okay? And then lastly, they did a very interesting thing where they used plants to show the effects of drinking water over soda. So here's the three plants that they placed in the classroom. On the left was water, where they got this beautiful flowering plant, you know, vibrant and everything. In the middle was nothing. They gave them nothing, no water, no juice. And, and the plant had no flowers whatsoever. And on the last one, they gave them sugar-sweetened beverages, which caused these mutated, ugly-looking leaves. And the children all got scared of this because they didn't want to drink stuff that was going to give them mutant leaves, and they stopped drinking this. They put these data on run charts. This is the graphical statistical tool that we use, time series analysis. They put these things on run charts and just to translate the Spanish. What it says is on the, the top graph is the number or the percentage of children drinking sugar-sweetened beverages. It, you can see how that plummets after several weeks of these things down to from 60, 70 percent of children drinking these things down to less than 20 percent. And likewise, the number of glasses of water that are being consu consumed uh, per, per child is going up to two to three per day. So the, I, I think that what you're doing with the envelope key system here is, in fact, assuming a bunch of this, a tremendous amount of capacity and skill available throughout the country. And what you're doing here with the envelope key system is bringing those people forward that would not necessarily otherwise be recognized, otherwise be tapped, or otherwise be asked to participate in formal healthcare living practice. So you're building them up, bringing them in, assuming that they can provide the care that you desperately need them to provide. And they're now the last one that I'll mention uh, as I close is the idea of changing the balance of power. And of all of the ones that I've shown so far, I think this is perhaps the most powerful uh, idea for how we might change our systems more fundamentally into the future. And but the, the, the premise here is that uh, we have to recognize fundamentally, this is uh, Victor Fuchs, who's a health economist at Stanford, 50 years ago, a few recognized what this means here. Recognized that what we provide in, in healthcare is not a, a product. It's not something that is produced in the factory and then given to somebody. But what we actually are doing is we're delivering a service, fundamentally. And services are different than products because people build services together in a relationship. When you go to a restaurant and the wait staff helps you with the food, you're building a relationship and that your experience at that restaurant is co produced person preparing your food and the person serving you. If you have a bad waiter, you don't have a good experience, you don't like the restaurant, you don't have a good meal. If you come in angry or upset or you have a bad companion with you for dinner, you don't have a good experience with the food. If the food preparation is not very good, you don't have a good experience with the food. Your experience of that activity is uh, co-produced by multiple actors working together in synchrony What is a healthcare service? A healthcare service results in activity through uh, 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 habits and vulnerabilities and knowledge and skill that we administer in that relationship. But in the quality world, in the, in the systems improvement world, we would focus heavily on the right side of the spot, on the activities. We measure all the activities, we pay for the activities, and we rarely pay attention to the fundamentals around how the relationship is functioning. It's as if we were treating this. quantifying this as our only outcome, not recognizing that, in fact, there's a whole lot of other things that make this more manageable or less manageable, depending on the circumstances of his, uh, in his time. So just for a very brief moment, I want to tell you the story of this guy, Christian Farmer, who we met now more than almost a decade ago in our innovation team. So Christian was a young guy, 30 years old, and he developed a rapidly progressing venereal nephritis, a kidney disease, that made him dialysis dependent at a very early age. Early he was a Saab engineer, he worked on cars, uh, he understood that he had a very successful career, a very successful job, and suddenly this guy needed hemodialysis three times a week, and if you know anything about hemodialysis, that means 
he had to go into the hospital and sit there from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. or 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Either 9 to 1 or 1 to 6 every every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, making it impossible for him to hold his job. His job was being fed. And so Christian said, "I'm an engineer. I know how these. I'm looking at this dialysis machine. I see how the dialysis machine works. I can understand the."
ಅಧಿಕಾರ ಅವರಿಗೆ